appreciate you choosing to spend some time with us tonight to learn about subsidy payments and how rates work. Uh, my name is Lisa Roman, and I'm one of the subsidy program specialists with the Office of Child Care. And we're also joined tonight by the rest of our provider helpline support team, which is program specialist Teal Davis, support specialists Connie Fowler and Dallin Adams. And also joining us is our subsidy program manager, Ann Stockham Mejia, our associate director, Nuna Phillips, and director Rebecca Banner, I believe, may join us as well. Um, so before we actually start the slideshow, we have just a few housekeeping items. Um, as I've said, all the all participants will be muted just due to the large number of attendees. We don't want to mute your questions, though. We want to address your questions. So as we go through the slideshow, you can put your questions in the chat or in the comments as they come up, and we'll come back to the questions at the end of the slideshow. Uh, we have several staff with us tonight to help address your questions and concerns. Um, just remember that this is not the right place to ask case specific questions. So please don't include any names or case numbers in your questions. Uh, we will post this webinar online with our other webinars on the jobs.utah.gov website as soon as possible. And with that, um, ah, yes, let me put that in the chat. I'm just gonna type a note for everyone here. For those who can't hear. Okay, well with that, here we go on the slideshow. And again, welcome everyone. We're, we're really glad to see some familiar names out there. This webinar will provide an explanation of how DWS childcare subsidies are calculated and the factors that affect the subsidy payment amount. And we will also address common questions regarding subsidy calculations. As a child care provider, you may question at times why a child is receiving a certain amount of subsidy and how DWS arrives at the amount. You may wonder why subsidy doesn't cover your full charges or what caused a change in a subsidy payment. As you are probably aware, subsidy payments may vary for each family. DWS subsidy payment calculations are based on many factors. But we're going to look first at three main factors that can affect a subsidy payment. One, the established maximum subsidy rate set by DWS for the provider type and the age of the child. Two, the provider's monthly charges. And three, the parent or guardian's participation hours or the need for child care. We will then discuss some additional factors that may affect the final payment amount. First, let's look at monthly local market rates, or MLMR for short. The Child Care and Development Fund, CCDF, is the principal source of federal funding for the child care subsidy program. CCDF requires agencies to conduct a market rate survey of licensed child care providers or an alternative cost of care study every three years to assess current child care market rates based on the provider type and the age of the child. DWS then uses the market rates to set child care subsidy rates that help subsidy eligible households to afford most providers in the state. Different provider types and age groups have different maximum subsidy rates. You can view the current payment tables broken down by provider type online at the website on your screen. It's a long one, so I'm hesitating just a minute so folks can write that down if they want to, but it will be in the slideshow when it's posted online.
Let's go ahead and look at that subsidy chart. So you can see how the MLMR, the local market rate, is applied to each provider type and age group. Using an example of a two-year-old child attending a licensed center, the maximum monthly subsidy would be $819. In this example, $819 is the starting point for determining the actual monthly subsidy payment. There are other factors that can change the final subsidy amount. Let's compare that same child attending a licensed family provider. The maximum subsidy and the starting point for subsidy calculation would be $685. The second factor to consider is your rate or your provider monthly charges for each age group. Your actual rates may be more or less than the maximum subsidy payment allowed. All providers must report their full-time out-of-school monthly rates on care about child care and caveat all providers except FFN providers. It is important to report accurate rates as these rates are also published for the public. However, if you report a rate higher than the maximum subsidy rate, DWS can still only pay up to the maximum subsidy amount allowed if the household qualifies for full-time subsidy. If your rate as reported on Care About Child Care is less than the MLMR, we will use that rate as your maximum monthly subsidy rate. DWS can never pay you more than your published rate. Let's go back to our earlier example of a two-year-old in a licensed center. The MLMR is $819 per month. If the provider reports that their full-time charge is $750, that becomes the maximum we can pay. If the provider reports that the monthly charges are $1,000, DWS can still only pay up to the MLMR, the maximum allowed subsidy payment. Providers are required to report any lower rate for an individual child directly to DWS. Some providers give discounts for various reasons, such as part-time attendance, shared parental responsibility, or for an employee's children. Be sure to report any discount offered to a family, either by email or through the DWS provider portal. Oh, I just said that. You must report any lower discount or custom rate through the DWS provider portal or by email to OCC for new cases. If, you're changed, if you are charging a lower rate, please report the correct rate whenever you are reporting start dates. When a lower rate is reported, that becomes the maximum subsidy amount that can be paid for that child. To report a lower rate for an ongoing case or for an individual child on the DWS provider portal, Go to the I want to box near the bottom of every screen on the portal, which shows common links to actions, including reporting a change for a case or a child, or use the action buttons on the case for the children on the children in care tab. <clears throat> when reporting a rate change, whether more or less, please remember to report full time rates on care about child care and reduced individual custom rates in the DWS provider portal or by email. Always report changes by the 25th of the month so that the correct rate can be applied timely to the following month. Rate changes reported in one month will be effective for the next month and cannot usually be retroactive. The third major factor affecting subsidy calculation is customer participation or need for childcare. Not all households qualify for full-time subsidy. The screenshot shown is from the DWS provider portal case details screen. In this example, the approved hours are 172 per month, which equates to full-time or 40 hours per week. A household that qualifies for 20 hours of childcare per week would show 86 hours for the month. Checking the approved subsidy, the, pardon me, the approved hours in the portal may tell you why a household is receiving less than the maximum subsidy.
a household may qualify for fewer hours due to a number of factors. The parent or guardian's regular work hours may average less than full time. The family may have other arrangements for part, part of the time, or there may be shared custody that lowers the hours that DWS can subsidize for that parent. Some parents must negotiate their monthly child care need with a DWS employment counselor based on approved activities. Parents can request more hours of child care if their needs change. Remember that except for customers working with an employment counselor, subsidy hours were not usually decreased during the 12 months following the approval, but could increase. Sometimes documentation of an increased need may be required. So far, we've talked mostly about rates for full-time care. Let's talk briefly about part-time subsidy calculations. For less than full-time care, we use a formula to calculate subsidy rates based on the number of hours that customers are approved for. We have created four tiers or ranges of hours, which allow for flexibility with work schedules. We have set rates for parents participating or having a childcare need from one to 14 hours per month, 15 to 22.9 hours, 23 to 31.9 hours, and 32 hours or more. We've now reviewed the three main factors that DWS uses to determine subsidy payments. The established maximum monthly subsidy rate set by DWS, the provider's monthly charges, and the parent or guardian's participation hours. DWS will compare these three factors and select the lowest amount as the actual subsidy amount. What are some other factors that can affect subsidy payments? You might see credits or recoupments on a case at times, you will see that the subsidy amount on it shown on the children in care summary on your portal account and the amount on the detail screen do not match. This is most likely due to a recoupment that the parent owes and has chosen to have deducted from their current benefits. In this case, the parent is responsible for paying you the difference. At other times, a credit may be applied to a case if you've been paid too much in order to remedy or avoid an overpayment. This will reduce the subsidy payment issued to you for the month of the credit and is not the customer's responsibility. Household participation for most households are locked in at application and review. This means that their subsidy hours cannot be decreased during their review period. However, their approved hours and their subsidy could be increased if their need increases and they're not already receiving the maximum subsidy. Children with special needs requiring extra care in the child care setting can be subsidized at a higher rate. Documentation of increased need from an approved source, such as a medical doctor, is required at each application and review. Parents are responsible for reporting that a child has special needs and for obtaining the proper documentation to justify a higher payment. Subsidy payments may decrease mid-review or during the 12 months following the, the approval when a child has a birthday and qualifies for a lower amount. Additionally, there are times when benefits will be prorated such, such as when a child starts attending after the first of the month. Our system will automatically prorate the subsidy for a partial month, so you do not need to calculate or report a lower rate for the month. Also, when a parent completes an annual review after the due date, this will generate a lower subsidy for the partial month. Always remember that the child care payments are, are to subsidize the cost of child care and may not cover the full cost of child care. We are still temporarily waiving income-based co-payments for all families, but families may still owe you a portion of your charges. There is never a guarantee of payment by workforce services. If childcare assistance is denied, providers are responsible for collecting directly from the parent for any charges not covered by subsidy. 
parents or guardians are responsible for your payment. Your contract is between yourself and your customer. Please make sure that all customers understand their obligation, which includes doing whatever is required to receive a subsidy payment. As always, you can contact OCC with any questions or concerns. Um, our staff of four and our manager, we are, we're here to assist providers with any subsidy related questions. So we encourage you to never hesitate to ask those questions. Okay, with that, I'm going to go ahead and end this, the slideshow and then we'll take your questions. If you are unable to type a question in the comments or in the chat box, uh, please just uh, raise your hand and we will unmute for a moment and let you ask your question. I hope everyone can type them in because we get a lot, but we'll go one by one um, and address those questions for you. All right, one moment. Let me stop sharing and look at the questions that we've received. And we have a raised hand. Oh, I don't want to raise my hand. Heather, is your hand still up? There you are. Okay, Heather, you're getting a promotion to panelists so I can allow you to talk. I'm not sure it's working though. I'm getting an error that says you're using an older version of Zoom. Are you able to type your question into the chat box? That, that would be ideal. It's not letting me let, let you talk. And I apologize, our, our Zoom system did just get upgraded. So we've had a little bit of technical challenges as well. Um, all right, questions. I'm scrolling down. All right, we have a question from Brian. Does a parent's U.S. citizenship matter regarding their eligibility for this DWS subsidy? And Brian, the, the good answer is that as of March 31st, it will not matter. Um, parents with eligible children, children who are citizens or um, eligible non-citizens will be able to receive subsidy. That's a change and we're really happy to be able to do that. All right, uh, the next question is, are we able to be paid by enrollment or not? The answer is yes. Uh, this is, uh, Deka has this question. We do pay by enrollment, but there are some specific uh, things that we need to be aware of. Pay by enrollment doesn't mean that you can just enroll a child and start being paid. A child must actually attend in the first month of enrollment at least eight hours in order for subsidy to be eligible. After that first month of attendance and enrollment, if the child doesn't attend for 90 days, you can continue to be paid. Uh, if a child does not attend a minimum of eight hours in one month within those 90 days, then you'll need to report that that child is no longer enrolled. So it can go up to 90 days but there does have to be a continued need for childcare. If a parent tells you that they're no longer going to bring their children or that they need to unenroll them or that they're moving or something like that, then that's not considered enrollment and you need to let us know. And then you would not be eligible for that payment. Okay, another question, Mrs. T. I have seven children that are receiving subsidy. Why does it only show four on Care About Child Care? Um, Mrs. T, I'm not sure. Care About Child Care, are you talking, if you're talking about your provider portal, it should show all of the children that are receiving subsidy. If you have some children that are not showing on your DWS provider portal on the Children in Care page, uh, please send us an email to the OCC at utah.gov so we can help you figure out what's going on there and make sure that all the children are showing correctly. Um, if you're talking about your available openings showing on the Care About Child Care website, uh, you will probably need to contact Care About Child Care about that question. I, I'm not sure 
um, Nunar, and is that something that a provider updates themselves? I do believe it is, but I'm not positive. Let's see. Lisa, this is Nuna. Yes, I believe that is something that providers can go into Care About Child Care, um, log into the Care About Child Care website mm -hmm. and update themselves. And if for some reason they're not able to, they should definitely contact Care About Child Care for some help. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Are we? The next question then is um, from Kathy. Are we able to call and talk about a certain case with one of you, or is it, or is that only between the parent and you? No, absolutely, Kathy. So um, I'll, I'll direct you at the same time to one of our other, for these, these last two questions, to one of our other webinars on the jobs.utah.gov, which is childcare related contacts. And that explains the roles of DWS and OCC, care about childcare, childcare licensing, and eligibility. So what we like to say is that OCC is the point of contact for providers that are having that have questions or are having an issue with a case. Um, eligibility is the contact point for parents to contact a worker and discuss their case. Sometimes workers will contact you directly, and you are welcome to contact a caseworker um, through the regular call line, but there is often a wait for help. So if you email OCC, OCC at utah.gov and tell us what your questions or concerns are about a case or um, if you have information to relay, that's what we're here for. And we're certainly happy to do that for you. So any questions on a case, never hesitate to email us. We do have a, a call line for the help, uh, the help staff as well, but it's a message phone only. So if it's something you really would like to talk about on the phone, um, just send us an email and ask us to call or leave a message and, and we will call you back. Okay. Um, Lisa, can, I would just add, you know, because the provider is a third party, we are limited in the amount of information. We can't go into very specific details about the parent situation, but we can give you general information about the case if something is missing or um, what might be, you know, causing the delay or the payment issue. So we will give you as much information as we can within our guidelines. Yeah, thanks, Anne. That's a good point. Um, we can't always tell you exactly what's going on, but we'll try to explain it so that it, it makes sense um, to you. And, and sometimes you need information in order to make business decisions for yourself. Uh, we certainly understand that. Okay, question from Julie. When I see a client's case is pending, how long is the typical time I should wait for their case to get approved? And Julie, that's that can vary quite a bit. If it's a new case, um, a brand new application, there are usually more documents to gather. However, um, we, we would probably say a couple weeks. Um, if you haven't seen anything happening in between two and three weeks, send us an email at OCC so we can take a look. And we may only be able to tell you that the customer needs to turn in some documents, but at least we, we can tell you. You can help your customer remember that they have things to turn in um, in order to receive a subsidy. Um, the, the pending time can take up to 30 days. That is the processing time that um, is allowable for an application. And so I'll go into a little bit of detail um, for you on that one. If a say a, a customer applies on March 1st and they turn in all their documents by the 30th day, by March 30th, but the caseworker doesn't get to process that case till April 7th, let's say, because sometimes it does take seven or more days to be processed. Since the customer turned everything in timely, we would go back to that March 1st application date to start the subsidy payment. If the customer didn't turn everything in timely, that case will auto deny. And that's when it doesn't show on your portal anymore as a pending case. And in that case, if the customer, if it was denied automatically because the customer failed to turn in documents, um, the date that they do turn in their documents basically becomes the new application date and the start date for subsidy benefits. 
So that was a long answer. I, I hope I hope that helped. Yes, yeah, specific case details we don't want to discuss here, discuss on on the the webinar because we can't um, disclose any information to anyone that's not involved with that case. So if you have specific case questions, again, that's when you want to email OCC, and that is what we're here to help for help with. Okay. Okay, question from Rosie. How about the child, a child that comes only one day a week or when holiday on holidays or when his school is closed? Does DWS pay the partial amount or of the full amount? That's a really good question, Rosie. So the general rule is that a parent should need childcare a minimum of eight hours in a normal month in order to remain eligible for childcare. If the child is enrolled and he comes one day a week or he comes when there's a holiday or school is closed, then the payment would really depend on your charges. If you charge the parent full time, no matter what, then DWS will pay the full amount if the, the household is eligible and if they've told us that they need full time child care. Um, parents are supposed to tell us how many hours of child care they actually need in a typical month. Um, so if you report a lower rate, a custom rate, as we talked about in the presentation, then we will pay that amount if the customer qualifies for the full amount. Um, I hope I covered that well, and it's, um, it's, it, it's always different depending on the parent's circumstances, but you can, you are absolutely able to charge the full amount, Rosie. We know that uh, having a child that comes part-time oftentimes still takes a full-time spot. So that's why that is allowable. Anne, do you have anything to add on that? I, I don't, I, I think you covered it okay. well, okay. thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, question from Lori. Uh, what about the enrollment clause I was reading? And it states, if a parent is on maternity leave and we hold the spots for two months for her other children, I was under the understanding that I would get paid for the children under this clause. So what is the criteria? Okay, and that's a, a really similar question to what we talked about a few minutes ago with the pay by enrollment. If the parent, it can be for any reason. It can be for maternity leave. It can be a child that goes to stay with grandma for two months in the summertime when there's no school. It can be if a child is sick, but if a child is unable to attend for 90 days, if you are holding the spot for those children, and that is key on, on the pay by enrollment always that you have to hold the spot. As long as you're holding that spot, you could be paid up to 90 days, as long as the parent doesn't withdraw the child or tell you that they're, they're not, they will no longer be enrolled or, or express in any way that they won't be back, then you could be paid by enrollment. Also, if the parent chooses to close their childcare case, and some parents do for whatever reason, they decide that if they're going to be on maternity leave for a couple of months or the kids are gone for a couple months, um, the parents may choose to close their case. And that is their right to do that, in which case we, we wouldn't be able to pay by enrollment. Okay, and Brian has a, another question. A Spanish speaking mom who doesn't speak English who should be eligible for this subsidy, what is the best way for her to apply? Well, Brian, uh, the best way for parents to apply or, or guardians is usually to go online at jobs.utah.gov and apply for assistance. That's the fastest way and the application is received immediately by a caseworker. Um, they can also apply in any workforce services office or they can contact us and ask for an application to be mailed. Um, it's fine if you if you have the capacity to assist a parent in applying online, that's no problem. We do have Spanish speaking caseworkers. If a parent calls in and has questions on the application process, if they choose the option for uh, Spanish, they will be connected to a worker that speaks Spanish who will be able to help them with their questions in, in Spanish. We also have translation services for other languages. If parents are not able to um, communicate in English, it's generally not a problem. They can call in and request interpretive services, and we will do our darndest to find someone that can help them. Uh, if we don't have anybody in a local office or available to help translate into whatever language the parent needs, we do have um, 
telephonic translation services available? So great question. Okay, and there's a question, Lucia, if you've been denied for subsidy, can you apply again? Um, so I'm not sure, Lucia, I know you're a, a provider. If you're asking about children in your care that have been denied subsidy, then the parent or guardian could certainly apply again. And we encourage them to do so, especially if circumstances have changed and they may qualify now where they didn't before, or perhaps they were denied because they didn't get all their information in, absolutely they can apply again. And the same for you, if you're applying for your own children, um, you can always reapply. We encourage people to do that. And can I put the correct email in the chat for uh, the OCC contact? You bet, that is, if I can remember how to type here, OCC at utah.gov. Okay. It doesn't need to go to attention anyone. Um, there are four of us who regularly work those emails. Um, you've, if you've sent emails to us before, you've probably seen my name and uh, Teal and Dallin, and of course our all-star Connie um, on those emails responding to you. So let's see. Okay, now I have to, I have to scroll back up. And thank you for, for asking that, Cherise. That was a really good question. Oh, thanks, Ann. Ann got that one too. Okay. Subida has a question. Um, parents call for their kids looking for an opening and they say that DWS has paid. I've trusted them and they run away without paying. What can I do? This is... <laughs> a question we would rather not see, unfortunately, because we know that sometimes providers end up not being paid. Um, the DWS provider portal is the provider tool for managing cases, and that, that uh, includes showing you cases that are pending um, for a payment to you. Now, when a case is pending, that means that the parent has applied, but that does not mean that they've been paid. That case has not been paid until that amount shows on your screen for the current month. Um, if that's ever in question, please send us an email to that email address above, OCC at utah.gov. Um, if, if the case is not on your portal, but you think it should be pending, we can check that for you. There are circumstances when a case will be pending and will show you as the provider, but it may not show up in the portal, just depending on the, the way that the parents applied. But that's what we're here for. Please don't wait uh, too long to contact us and ask about a case. You can always, even if it's in the beginning of the process and you need to know if they've applied and that they have reported that you are the provider, you can ask us that question. And at the same time, of course, remember that you do have to report any new children that should be on subsidy. Um, we need you to report the names of the children and the start date along with the parent's name and case number. And then we report that to the caseworker. That is a, a required verification before any subsidy can be approved. So yes, great question. I see some others agreeing with that, that question. Thank you. And so be that within a span of three months, do you still get paid from by DWS? And that's the pay by enrollment that we discussed. Um, if the parents are, if the children are not attending, but as far as you know, the parent still needs childcare. They have not unenrolled the child or told you in any way that they won't be back. Um, you don't need to report that until they have not attended for 90 days, okay? If they don't attend at all in 90 days, you need to let us know it at OCC at utah.gov or report that in the portal, okay? And like I said before, it's not an automatic pay by enrollment for three months. Uh, if the parent closes their case, withdraws the children or tells you they're not coming back, then that, that is reportable. Um, and at that point, the payment would stop. Okay, question from Ashley. I have a mom who is separated from the father with no custody agreement. Does she add to the details about the father on the application? She's worried it will affect him and doesn't want it to. 
Um, so we we have a lot of situations like that, of course. Um, single parents are often in dire need of child care assistance. Um, she should um, add any details about the custody arrangement. Workers will usually ask about that if there's an absent parent. And if there is no custody agreement, she can just tell the worker that. If she gets any help from the absent parent um, to pay for child care, she needs to report that as do providers. If there's an absent parent and that parent pays a portion of the child care directly to you, you need to report that to us as well. So they, they don't, parents don't need to, re, to provide a whole lot of information in this situation, but they, need to, they do need to report the basic details of the family arrangement. Um, that helps the workers determine um, how best to process that application so that we don't end up with any uh, incorrect payments or overpayments or, or underpayments or anything like that, okay? And also how do subsidies affect a family receiving them? For example, taxes. Um, subsidy benefits are not taxable for the family. They are taxable for providers that, that are paid over $600 um, in a year for providing care, but it doesn't affect the families um, at all, okay? Uh, if they have a portion that's that they have to pay out of pocket and they have, for example, flex benefits to cover uh, child care, then, then that's a, a more detailed discussion and you can certainly ask those questions. Um, probably better in an email so we can address it more directly. Okay, the page where- So this is Nuna. Can I just interrupt you really quickly? Yeah. I wanted to mention that um, there is a Q&A button on the Zoom and we have a few questions lingering there that came through a little bit earlier. So I just wanted to maybe see if you want to toggle over. One of them you already answered, but okay. just wanted to alert you to those questions. No problem, thank you. I was just, I was gonna go through to the end and so I could kind of get these um, done, and the, but I can toggle back and forth too. I lose my place in the chat if you toggle off of it. <laughs> it seems to go away. Um, I've put the website in there for parents to apply. And let's see. Okay, I'm gonna go into the Q&A for a second and then we'll come back to the chat questions. Thanks, Nuna. Because we certainly don't wanna forget those. This is, this is your opportunity, everyone, to ask questions. So please throw them in there. All right, Jenny, what is the correct way to report extra charges? Like days, the days, the, okay, the days the school districts throw in for distance learning. We do not always have the information by the 25th of the prior month. And Jenny, that's kind of difficult. Of course, if you, if you let us know by the last day of the month, we can usually help with that. Um, but that does also depend on your charges. If you're already charging full-time for full-time care, or if the parent uh, doesn't qualify for full-time care, sometimes there's not a lot we can do about that. But if you can get um, that information to us by the end of the month, we'll do our best to supplement where it's appropriate um, and get that information over to eligibility. The parent also needs to contact eligibility and tell them that they have an increased need. Um, Kind of the best way to do that, I think, is to average the attendance for each child so that that's kind of built in. And we know that some months they may not attend as much and some months they may attend a little bit more, if that makes sense. Okay. And again, certainly, um, Jenny, if you have, if you need more details, we are more than happy to go over that with you um, through an email. That would be awesome. Okay, Ashley, um, okay, here's the question about being separated from the father. Uh, we did cover that one. And Jenny, yes, some of your rates are lower than the market rate. If you're, uh, so let's come back to that question. If you have reported a lower rate on care about child care, then that's the maximum amount that we can pay any child in your care, okay? Um, if, for example, the MLMR for that two-year-old is $819, but you've reported a rate of $750, we cannot pay over that amount. And those charges in Care About Child Care do absolutely need to be updated 
before the first of the month, unless there are some really extenuating circumstances. Um, if you're charging a parent a custom rate, then those are things that you have to monitor and try to be aware of ahead of time. For example, this time of year, we get questions about spring break. Providers need to be aware of when those things happen in their area. Different school districts can have different dates for things like that. So it, providers do need to be aware of breaks um, for the schools that they serve, the schools that their children and their care go to, so that you can adjust those rates ahead of time. Um, if it's if it's just a day here and there and it's not an ongoing change, we may not supplement that payment. Okay, and Ashley asks, what does it mean when a parent withdraws an application? Is that different from an auto denial? Yes, it, it is different. Parents can always call an eligibility worker and tell them that they want to withdraw their application, meaning that they no longer want to apply for the subsidy. The auto denial is when the parent doesn't follow through with their application and return the necessary documentation um, in order for us to make a determination. So yeah, that is a, a, a big difference. And Chelsea asks, is this reporting going to be uh, emailed to providers? Chelsea, we will post the webinar on the um, jobs.utah.gov website. And uh, maybe in, in a minute, if we still have some time, I can pull that up and show some of those um, webinars that we have available on there. There are several. They're on the jobs.utah.gov website. And if you go to the top right corner and click divisions, and if you look for subsidy resources, there are several uh, webinars posted in there for, uh, for you, for the providers with all kinds of information. Okay, and Charlene asks, is it, a, is it good for a provider to start taking care of the children before parents get approved in a case that the parent has to start working? And Charlene, that is, that's a business decision that each provider has to make for themselves. If you were, um, let me go over a scenario here. If a parent applies, say March 1st, and they have not been approved yet, and you start taking the children on March 8th, then March 8th would be the, the earliest date that we could pay the subsidy if they are found eligible for a subsidy. The problem that we sometimes run into talking about auto denials and such, uh, such things is that if the parent doesn't follow through in that case auto denies, very, very rarely can we go back and pay back to the start date when the children started care. So that's why I say don't wait too long uh, to check on a case. If you're not seeing any details on your portal uh, or if it's getting towards the 30 day mark or even the three week mark and you are not sure what's going on with the case, please get in touch with us and, and let us look that up for you. Um, and that's why we say that parents are always responsible for the charges from their provider. Um, providers can charge a registration fee. You can charge a portion of the month or all of the month up front if that makes you more comfortable. We know that sometimes that doesn't really work for parents, but um, if they have paid something in that they're anticipating getting back from you, that might help them remember to get their documentation in. Um, we also can, uh, we've, we've work with a few providers that prefer to report the start dates as uh, the child can start the day after subsidy is approved or two days after subsidy is approved, which gives you a chance to be able to view in your portal that payment that is going out to you before uh, the children start. So even if you say they can start the day after, say that's tomorrow and you check your portal in the morning and say, oh great, we got a payment coming, um, these children can start care. Just be sure and let us know if the start date changes. Okay. And I think that that is all of the questions on the um, Q&A right now. So let me scroll back up in our chat and find the remaining questions. Okay, and uh, I did write, uh, Evelia, I did write the, the website where parents can apply and I'll say that out loud again too. That's jobs.utah.gov. And there's a backslash my case. That is the, the my case system is the application system. All right, Jenny 
asks, what is the correct? OK, I think we did do this one already. Distance learning, snow days for public school. You don't always have the information. Yeah, Jenny, if you have if you need more details on that, let us know. OK. Uh, let's see, Charlene asks, if a parent applies for subsidy before they're approved, is it legal or good for the provider to take uh, care of the children? And like I said on, on the Q&A, same question. Um, it's certainly legal. Um, workforce Services, Office of Child Care, we cannot guarantee payment. Uh, the parent may end up owing you some money depending on um, whether they're approved, okay? And let's see, Julie asks, and this is a great question. Is there a spot on my portal that I can report the child's start date? I usually get a phone call from you asking if the child is in care and the date they started. So no, Julie, there's not a spot to report a start date on the portal, nor is there a spot to report a custom rate for a child that hasn't been approved yet. So our caseworkers will normally call providers or at least attempt to contact a provider to verify a start date and um, the correct charges for a brand new child. Um, you can also email that to OCC. If you know that that child's been in care or going to start soon and you haven't received a call from a, a, a caseworker, just go ahead and email that to us and we report that information directly to the caseworker. And again, we would need the parent's name and case number if you if you have the case number. Sometimes you may not have that. Um, children's names and start dates. And sometimes we'll need to ask for a birth date uh, for the children just to make sure we get the right case if you didn't give us a case number. But great question there. Okay. Subida asks, does this count for the licensing hours for the certificate? And no, this, this uh, meeting, this webinar is for informational purposes. Um, so it does not count for licensing hours or education hours. Okay. Christina asks, I have had parents tell me I need to call DWS before they can enroll. I've always been told all of my information is already there. Did that change? No, the, the process hasn't changed. Um, and they may, parents may want you to call and verify that the children are enrolled. That's just our normal reporting process. Um, sometimes it gets lost in the translation. We need parents to tell their caseworker who their provider is going to be, which children will be in childcare, and when the start date is for each child. Then providers need to report that if they're not contacted by a caseworker, providers need to report that to OCC um, in the OCC at utah.gov email, or if you prefer to call, you can leave a message and we'll get back to you, okay? But we do require that, like I said earlier, that is a required verification that the provider verify the children in care and the enrollment or the, the actual start date of care, not just the enrollment date, but the start date of care before benefits can be approved. Okay, um, Nora asked, if I have my rates posted in the uh, Care About Child Care website, I don't need to report it to DWS, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. If your children, if the child is being charged the full-time rate, the rate that you post on Care About Child Care should always be your full-time out-of-school monthly rate. If you charge a child less than that for any reason, um, for example, if you have an employee that gets a discount or you're giving a part-time rate, um, you need to report that to DWS. And it, like I said, you can report that to a caseworker if they contact you to um, verify the start date. You can also report a reduced rate or you can report that by email to OCC. Great question. And Saran asks, do parents receiving subsidy for childcare report it to, for tax purposes? Because parents have asked me for receipts for taxes. Um, we're not tax experts, so I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail on that. We talked about that briefly a few minutes ago. Um, the benefits are not taxable, but parents may have other reasons why they need a receipt for taxes. Um, if they're using, for example, flex benefits, um, or, you know, I don't know, that would be a, a better question for a tax expert, really. Okay. 
And Jenny asks, is there a minimum amount that we have to report as an overpayment? And the answer to that is no. If you've been paid too much in a month, you need to report to us what the, what the overpayment was. We'll try to apply that as a credit to a coming month um, so that you don't have an actual overpayment. But remember that we have a, a couple of things going on here. We have a range of hours that the parent may fall into. And we also encourage providers to average the hours that a child should be in care um, in an average month. So the hours don't have to always be exact, Jenny. And as long as, um, you know, let's say the parent is approved for 172 hours, which is basically 40 hours a week, but maybe for a couple of weeks, the kids only come for 20 hours because they were sick or on vacation or whatever. Those aren't overpayments. Um, or if the child attends a little bit less for whatever reason, those wouldn't be. But other than situations like that, yes, all, all overpayments would need to be reported. You can also apply a credit um, through the portal on the actions uh, button on each child's each case name on the children and care tab, there is an option to report a child care, a DWS credit there. And so, for example, if for whatever reason a child has a $16 overpayment in a month, um, then you can report that there or by email. All right. Uh, Debota, great question. I have a special needs child in my daycare. How do you decide what the pay will be? As we went over briefly, Children who have special needs can be subsidized at a higher rate. Um, th they may have special needs that don't require extra care in the daycare setting, uh, but if they do and the parent presents proper documentation of that, then we can pay at a higher rate. So what we generally do is pay the infant rate for that child for your daycare. So it wouldn't matter what the age of the child was. Um, for example, an, an infant rate in a center is 1,040. You may have a six-year-old with special needs uh, in that center, and they could be paid that infant rate. And if it's, a, if it's an infant, then we'll look back to the next, what we call the next uh, level of providers. So an infant in family care, for example, may be paid at a higher rate than their normal infant rate. Okay, Stephanie, really good question. You guys have really great questions tonight. We sure appreciate that. Um, can licensed commercial preschools get subsidy? So <laughs> the, the short answer is no, not today, but uh, we are working on that. And when the programming is completed in our systems, we will be able to uh, pay subsidy for commercial preschools. So keep your fingers crossed. And uh, we have folks working very hard on that to get that done. Um, so hopefully soon. And are we thinking July 1st? I would say no sooner than July 1st, but we are, but we are working on that. We sure are. It, it, a lot of it is out of our control, you know, because it requires programming changes and, um, we need to be prioritized with other projects within the department. So it, it, it takes some time whenever we wanna make a policy or system change. Yeah, and that is a, it is a change to our systems and policies. It takes massive numbers of men and women hours to program those changes. But so keep your eyes and ears open. Um, as soon as that is, is available, we'll probably announce that um, on the webpage or by email to the, to the preschools, I imagine. We'll let you know. Okay. All right, Heather, if parents have two children and only one needs to be full-time until summertime, do they need to have both children on the application? So yes, Heather, they do need to have both children on the application. Well, um, families, when they apply, they need to list everyone that lives in their household in general. Um, if you mean, does one, does one child need care now and one doesn't need any care until summertime, then they just need to let the worker know that. And that's another reason why we depend on you as the provider to say, yeah, right now I have uh, Johnny, he's starting March 8th, 
um, but his sister Carol won't start until June 1st. And then you'll have to tell us closer to June 1st that that other child is going to start. But they should be included on the case and on the application, absolutely. Good, good question. If that, if that second child is going to need part-time care until school's out, then absolutely we need that, all that information so that we can uh, set up part-time care for that child. Okay, Anna. In the event that the government orders the closure of classes for days or weeks, how can we charge for those days if it passes without notice? I'm not sure what, what you mean by the passes without notice, but uh, certainly in the current um, climate in the world, we, we do have orders for closure of classrooms or even whole facilities, um, usually for COVID exposure. So if, the, if a classroom closes, now this, this answer can get a little bit complicated. If a classroom closes, um, you can continue to be paid throughout the days that that classroom is closed, as long as those children remain enrolled. Okay, sometimes a parent might need to desperately need to take their child to another provider uh, during, say, you're closed for 10 days and a certain classroom is closed for 10 days. If they need to be paid, uh, if a second provider needs to be paid, then we can do that and you can ask them to contact a caseworker. But you shouldn't have an overpayment for that reason unless the temporary closure is more than 14 days. So providers are required to report to child care licensing if they're going to be closed or if classrooms are going to be closed. And they will let us know how long. Um, if your whole facility closes and it goes over 14 days, um, that's another another situation and we may have to assess an overpayment um, but uh, that would be if the parents seek other care so yeah tough times um, we certainly sympathize with you guys and everyone's been through a lot with these situations okay mike says you prefer not getting that call from the caseworker and uh, have the email for a paper trail. Mike, you, you probably will always get calls here and there from workers, but you are always welcome to send it through email, even if you've already gotten a call, that's fine. We'll still report it to the case. Um, the paper trail will still be there and uh, that's absolutely fine. Sometimes it's a little faster. Workers can get cases approved a little quicker if they just call and get the information directly from you. But like I said, you're always welcome to still email that to us. Oh, where'd I go? Okay, Ashley, I have a family who applied, but now the mom is between jobs. She got her last check in February, but starts her new job next week. Will that affect her approval this month? Oh, another really, really good question. So if the parent hasn't worked in March, so they're really not eligible for benefits for subsidy until they start their new job. But if she's starting her new job next week, then we could start subsidy next week. You wouldn't have to wait for the first or anything like that. Um, and as a matter of fact, if a parent is starting a new job and we can verify that they have a job starting, we can get a good idea of their income and we have a verified start date from you, we can issue what's called upfront childcare, which is kind of a presumptive eligibility even if we don't have all of the documentation that would normally be required, because we know parents need childcare to start a job. So we want to get that approved as quickly as possible for them. So if the parent applies or has already applied, um, she would need to verify her work situation both, uh, well, for the upfront, they don't, wouldn't need to verify the, the termination from the last job, but would need to tell us the approximate income that she might get this month from either job. And like I said, report the provider, you would report the start date and the children in care to us like normal. Um, and then the following month for, for the April benefits, if we're looking at this month, the parent would have to provide all the documentation required in order to keep those benefits going. Okay, really, really great questions. Lisa, can I just interject? It, it's after 7.30 now. 
Um, so there are still a few more questions that for those of you that want to um, stay on the call, you're welcome to, um, or if you want to leave, Absolutely. we appreciate your time and spending this hour with us. Um, we won't be accepting any more questions, but we will try, we'll stay on maybe another eight minutes until 740 to see if we can get through the remaining questions that are in the chat. Yeah, great. Thank you, Anne. And if you don't get to submit all your questions, just like I said, email those to OCC at Utah.gov. Okay. Um, this question from Zubida, what number does DWS have to contact them? And you know what, off the top of my head, um, yeah, I can remember it's, uh, you can, you can call us, but it's only a message line, Zubida. So no one's going to answer the phone. You'll have to leave a message and we'll get back to you. Um, that's why we encourage people to email uh, their questions. We can also be, you can also be a little bit more thorough in your message if you email, but you can call 866-435-7414 and it's option five to reach the OCC helpline. Okay, wonderful questions. And Maxine asks, will that credit roll over to the next school year? Um, Maxine, I'm not sure what credit you mean. You might need to send us an email to, to clarify that a little bit. If you're When we say credit, we're usually talking about a situation where you were paid too much and you need to apply a credit uh, for a subsequent month that will be deducted from the ongoing subsidy costs. Uh, if the case is, let's say you have an overpayment for the month of May and the case is not open for June, July, or August, then no, that wouldn't carry over to the next school year and it would be reported as an overpayment. Um, if that doesn't address your question, please please send us an email. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. I just don't quite understand the context of that question. I need a little bit more detail. Okay. Ashley, if a provider's license for a capacity of 15 but six by our city, can you have more than six children enrolled and on subsidy as long as I stay in my limits daily? For example, one child just comes on Monday and another child comes the rest of the days of the week. And Ashley, this, is, this may be a question that is better uh, directed to childcare licensing, um, but I'm gonna take a stab at it here. Um, if the city only allows you to have six, and actually, that's a question you would have to probably address to the city. If they only allow you to have six at a time, um, I, I would assume that that means six children present in the facility at one time, but, but you probably should ask them that. Okay, sorry about that. Lori asks, is it illegal to charge a parent more for a child with special needs? If I don't charge other children with special needs more, does DWS still pay more for those children? So Lori, uh, we, we talked a, a bit about this earlier. It's not illegal to charge a parent more for a child with special needs. Um, not all children will have special needs in childcare. Um, they may have special needs in an educational setting or in other settings, but maybe they're just fine in childcare and they don't really need any extra attention. Um, then we wouldn't pay more. Uh, we pay more when a medical doctor or another approved um, official tells us uh, on the forms that we send out to parents and, and parents take those forms to their provider and bring them back to us. If a, a medical provider or other professional tells us that that child needs more um, care in childcare, then yes, we'll, we'll pay more for those children. Okay, and like I said, it, no, it's not illegal for you to charge more um, so I don't know if legal is the right word, but yeah, I, I do think I there are discrimination asking. laws. You do need to be careful about that. Yeah. But but we as DW, so even if you may not charge more, we can subsidize more of the, the care yeah. for those special services. So you can keep your rate the same. And if the child qualifies for special needs, we can still supplement and give you an additional payment amount. Yeah, thanks. And that's a really good point that you don't have to change your charges to be eligible for that increased payment that the parent just needs to follow through with that documentation. Thanks, Sam. 
Okay, and let's see the numbers. So provider can, and Zubida, I think we we covered that. Um, the numbers so that you can contact us. All right. And the recorded Zoom will be found on jobs.utah.gov under the child care division and under the subsidy resources. Let's see, Betty asks, how can I get care about child care number? Betty, I'm going to make myself a note right now. I'll email that to you in the morning, OK? I'll email you the number for the office in your region. All right. Thanks, Connie, for jumping in there. Let's see. And Maxine, I think that was a follow up from another question paid too much and then they went to the summer program. So yeah, if they paid, if you were paid too much that needs to be reported either as a credit if it can be for the very next month or as an overpayment. Okay. Thanks, Joyce. We sure appreciate the comments and questions. see okay i think that was those are all the questions as always we're there every day to help and answer those questions that, that might pop up in your mind tonight at two o'clock in the morning right um so thanks again everyone for joining us and um if you enjoyed this if you have ideas for other topics that you'd like to see covered in an, a live or a recorded webinar please don't hesitate to uh, let us know about those occ at utah.gov is where you can always find us and Thank you so much for being here tonight.